Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Wilmot Institute's second uh, web talk of our series of 12 web talks. Uh, this is to commemorate our, our, our 20th anniversary. Uh, we were established by the National Spiritual Assembly in late January of 1995. And so this is our uh, 21st year, and we're very excited at this point to be able to offer people these talks as part of our celebration. Our speaker, Ian Kluge, uh, has been a uh, high school teacher uh, in English and Comparative Civilizations for almost 30 years. He's also a poet, a playwright, and an independent uh, philosophical scholar. He's published many papers in the Erfan Colloquium series about uh, philosophy as it relates to the Baha'i Faith. And of course, he's starting a course on the Baha'i Faith and philosophy for the Wilman Institute in about 10 days. I believe it starts on February 10th. We still have room for people to sign up if they're interested, and we hope people will. We'll have this talk probably available not only to the whole public on our YouTube channel uh, within 24 hours, but we'll also have it as part of the course. I, I'm assuming that we'll be using it that way uh, as well. Uh, today, Ian is speaking on the subject of the Baha'i proofs for God based on the writings of Baha'u'llah and Abdu'l-Baha. So I will turn this all over to Boyd to turn on uh, Ian's uh, control of the screen. Okay, well, first of all, I'd like to welcome everybody, and I hope you find this this next little while uh, really worth the time that you're, you're going to put into it because, of course, as you're all aware, the, with the uh, advances or attacks by the new atheist movement and others, this issue of just the existence of God has become an important philosophical issue, and, of course, the new atheists dismiss it as part of that simply a belief in God is simply a result of religious dogmatism or ignorance. And I hope to be able to show you that belief in God can be rational and logically coherent. And I studied philosophy and logic, and so I'm going to be defining those terms uh, quite shortly. I also want to prove to you or show to you that the proofs of the Baha'i writings are log logically valid and defensible. In other words, you may not persuade somebody that God exists, even with a logical proof, but you will be able to demonstrate to them that believing in a supreme deity is not an illogical, indefensible uh, position to take. What I also am going to do is to update explanations for some of the traditional proofs, uh, which ba Abdu'l-Baha especially gives. Uh, these proofs are still valid, but in their the form, the language of philosophy, the language of argument has changed, and it's not always easy for modern people to see uh, the original argument underneath. And finally, of course, I want to, would like to persuade people to engage in a philosophic study of the Baha'i writings, and that includes especially the correlations with other systems as promoted by the Guardian. So that, that's my, my goal. I have all this stuff written down, by the way, because uh, I'm gonna, there's a lot to cover, and I'm going to try to cover most of it, uh, and uh, so we have some time for questions. So first of all, there is a belief that the existence of God can't be proven. Well. From the Baha'i perspective, that is simply not the case. Um, you can see here, Abdul Baha, the existence of a divine being is, you know, can be established on the basis of logical uh, reasoning, okay, or the basis of logical proofs, the reality of the, okay. Now, Abdul Baha isn't saying we can tell what God is, but he can, he is saying that we can tell and prove that God is. Okay, um, and again, that's emphasized in the next uh, quotation there. Um, there are some philosophers, people will usually quote Kant to say that philosophers uh, that cannot pr provide, prove that a God exists, but the easy answer to that is, unless somebody wants to get into the nitty grits, is that Kant's belief that no proof of God is possible works only if you accept Kant's premises and Kant's system. 
and if you don't, the, the proofs aren't – what he says is not binding. Um, and again, a very, very important. This does not mean that every believer can be persuaded that God exists because people can be persuaded uh, by many kinds of things, and logic isn't always a persuasive thing for everybody. Um, I, I knew a Holocaust survivor who no matter how much you showed her about the proofs of God, she was just not capable. She just couldn't believe, be persuaded anymore, and I think that was a matter of spirituality and experience, not a lack of appreciation for knowledge. So don't, please don't confuse persuasion and proof. And I use the word untenable, which in logic means a position can't be defended. Uh, without getting entangled in logical errors of various kinds. Um, that's what that term means. In logic, we tend not to say something is true or untrue. Um, we simply say that's untenable, which means if you argue against this or if you argue against, argue for your position, you're going to get yourself caught in all sorts of logical errors. Why is this important to the Baha'i writings? Because I know that philosophy uh, among some Baha'is has a bad reputation. It, it's dismissed as something that begins and ends in words, which is interesting because that quote is from Shoghi Effendi, and it is only a very small part of the quote, and the rest of the quote goes on to say philo philosophy is extremely important and should be pursued by Baha'is. And of course, Abdul Baha tells us that in this age, the peoples of the world need the arguments of reason. And I think that's, that's almost self-explanatory. And the importance of reason in the Baha'i writings. Unlike any other religion in the world, the Baha'i writings have an enormous amount of them in about reason. And this statement here almost makes reason or being reasonable or makes being reasonable one of the criteria for believing in God. If religious beliefs and doctrine is at variance with reason, it proceeds from this limited mind of man and not from God. And he says the heart finds no rest in it. So there's a connection between rationality and reason and the heart. And he says real faith is impossible. So you cannot just have faith as a sheer act of will to say, I will believe this. You know, I believe because it is absurd, as Tertullian said in the 4th century. Uh, how can a man believe that which he uh, knows is to be opposed to reason? And then can the heart accept that which reason denies? And the answer, of course, those are rhetorical questions, and the answer, of course, is no, the heart cannot accept these. And then he says, if religion were contrary to logical reason, and again, notice the use of the word logical here, that it would cease to be religion and be mere tradition, and then the, the foundations of religion are reasonable. This is one of the significant foundational differences from a philosophical perspective, which, of course, is where I'm coming from, uh, between the Baha'i faith and other religions. Um, what do we mean by a logical proof? Because that's the term that Abdu'l Baha uses. And a logical proof, you know, basically is a series of connected inferences. In other words, one thing leads to another in a way without contradiction. So if you say, um, cats, all cats say meow, let's say for, or all house cats say meow, and then you say, you know, uh, Mitzi is a house cat, therefore Mitzi says meow. You will see that, that each step is co connected to the other without a contradiction and is actually contained in the first premise already. And a conclusion is necessary if it cannot be denied without falling into contradiction or known facts um, or falls into self-contradiction. And that's well, – sometimes people make statements that – basically fall into self-contradiction, or as we call them in logic, self-refuting propositions. And I'll give you an example of one that is very commonly heard nowadays. Um, all truth is relative. This is logically just meaningless. It has no meaning. If this claim uh, – is, is this claim true? Well, if it is true that all truth is relative, then the claim that some truths are absolute 
may also be true, in which case the claim all truths are relative is not true. If this is – is this statement absolute? Well, if it's absolutely true that all truths are relative, then this statement has contradicted itself. In other words, asserted the opposite of what it claims. It simply has no meaning. There is – no one can give that a meaning without – falling into self-contradiction. It doesn't matter if you say all truths are matters of perspective. Uh, you might try that sometime and see you will get exactly the same result. What do the writings say about logic? The human spirit consists of the ration or logical reading, reasoning faculty. If religion were contrary to logical reason, it would cease to be a religion. Uh, if we – in you know, he insists that we use the established modes of the logical modes of the intellect. And if you are really interested in following this up, I've had two articles the, um, on this published. One, uh, and the information is down there, and where the those are the URLs where they are available to you, uh, where you can pursue these matter in, in considerable depth. Both of these papers are about 60 or 70 pages long, so they're like little mini books, but uh, some people can get really interested in this, and that, that would help them along. What do we mean by God? This is where the rubber hits the road. The rest was getting the wheels on the car. This is where the rubber hits the road, because this is where a lot of arguments degenerate into confusion. When we discuss the God of the philosophers, as he is known, we do not mean God in the personal sense or the God image of any religion, okay? We mean an entity of some kind, but it has certain characteristics. It is beyond time, and it is absolutely independent of anything else. Okay, uh, it does not exist in space, and again, it is not conditioned by time, and it is absolutely immune from change or influence or limitation by anything else. Therefore, it is omnipotent and omniscient, and we can go a long, long way with these basic characteristics of God. And when you talk about God in the philosophical sense, that will give you a brand new perspective on the concept of God in Buddhism, for example, which is another area I spent a lot of years with Buddhism, uh, where the concept exists, although not in the Western, in the Western version of it. Okay, the, the so clarifying this philosophical uh, definition prevents a lot of errors in reasoning. Um, and it will stop short a lot of false arguments that just waste everybody's time. You know, if somebody, you know, the common atheist argument is if God created everything, who created God? This is very simply what's called a category mistake, in which a category mistake is you, in which you confuse one kind of thing things that are subject to time and space and are dependent with another type of thing which doesn't have these characteristics, i.e. the philosophical God. In other, in other words, you're treating God as if God were just another thing in this universe, in which case the question who created God would make sense. But the whole concept of God is about the fact that we are not talking about just another thing in the creation of that is created in this universe. So that's a very basic elementary logical error called a category mistake. It's like category mistake is when you confuse apples and horseshoes. Uh, they're just not the same kind of things. The other logical mistake in that question is uh, you're, the atheist or the person arguing against God is substituting their concept of God, which is uh, for uh, for yours, and in an argument that's changing the subject. If the argument is truly to demonstrate the philosophical existence of God, then you simply can't slide in and uh, bring in a different 
definition of God and say, but it doesn't prove this. That's a second, that's another discussion. But they're simply changing the subject and just because the atheist's version of God as a personal entity, for example, or the denial of that leads to paradoxes doesn't mean that the religious and philosophical concept does too. It's, it, it just doesn't work. And I point that out because the, these are two places where discussions about the existence of God very often go wrong. And they then head off, you know, they, they go wrong because people start pursuing uh, unfruitful lines of reasoning instead of saying, okay, let's stick to the subject. Let's talk about the God of the philosophers. That's the God that I'm discussing at this point. And that Abdul Baha discusses. Okay, the first uh, argument for the existence of God is called the prime mover argument. And um, it's interesting to see that Baha'u'llah actually uses that word. And of course, the, the prime mover argument was first given us by Aristotle. And there is a lot of the, the writings confirm. A, you know, significant parts of Aristotle's metaphysics and physics. Not all of them, but significant parts thereof. And, and that's all. I'm not saying the writings confirm Aristotle's writings about the weather or biology or anything else. Just the prime mover. And Abdul Baha gives the basic principle of that prime mover argument. Okay, and he says, such a, a line of causation, such a process of causation goes on, and to admit that this process goes on indefinitely is manifestly absurd. Thus, the chain of causation must of necessity end, uh, in, oh, I've made a mistake there, lead eventually to the one who is self-dependent and the ultimate cause. So Abdul Baha denies the existence, and this is very important to get right, of a real infinity, a th an infinity of real things, not a theoretical infinity where you can count one, two, three, four, five, but of real things like little dominoes, uh, you know, each one separate and discrete from one another, uh, going on forever. And Abdul Baha says this is manifestly absurd because infinity has neither beginning nor end. And therein lies the problem. In order to get to the present moment, you would have to go through an infinite, infinite number of prior steps or causal events. Or to trace the source of a present event would go back to an infinite number of steps or causal events. This is logically impossible because you can never arrive at, in the present. So Abdul Baha is denying the existence of a real infinity. And for that reason, he says, sooner or later, any causal chain, chain of causes, will end up with God, an ultimate cause who is self-dependent, something that is not in itself caused by anything else. And uh, we'll have a little bit more to say about that in a moment. I just want to point out this is not a rehash of Zeno's paradox. I'm sure you all remember Zeno's paradox from school where, um, you know, the, the, the archer Achilles tries to points an arrow at the target that's 100 meters away, and Zeno tries to prove the arrow will never get there because first the arrow has to go halfway, and then halfway of that, and of that, and so on, ad infinitum. So the motion is impossible. The, the fact that the, there is no such thing as a real infinity is not a rehash of, er of Zeno's argument because Zeno's argument is based over theoretically subdividing a finite distance, you know, from A to B, 100 meters, and the argument about the impossibility of an infinite chain of causes is based on something where there is neither beginning nor an end. So this is a false analogy uh, that that refutation doesn't actually work. Uh, a nice little illustration, and I have to thank. 
my my dear old Jesuit logic teacher, Father Mackenzie, for this. To see why an infinite regress is manifestly absurd, imagine you wanting to borrow a book, but each person you go to has gone to some has already lent it to somebody else, and you're going from person to person infinitely. And nobody, nobody's got the book. You will never get that book, uh, and there is no way of getting that book. Uh, because okay, and sooner or later, if you want the book, you're going to have to get to somebody who has the book and does not have to borrow it from somebody else, and that somebody else is God in the philosophical sense. He actually is in a way separate from the chain of other borrowers because he actually has the book, just as God in the prime mover argument is separate and distinct from the rest of creation because he actually has the power. Uh, he is actually free of time and space and change and all those things. And Abdul Baha refers to this this proof of God, by the way, in many ways throughout the writings, but uh, I'll just refer to another one uh, in the same section. The least change produced in the form of the smallest thing proves there is a creator, because all actions, very simple, all actions lead to a first mover. And to illustrate the idea of why and, and a real infinite is impossible, not a theoretical infinite. This must be, this must be remembered. Uh, I don't know if any of you know who Bill Hatcher is, who is really the, the, the first person, as far as I know, to really study Baha'i philosophy in a, in, a, in a more technical sense. He and I used to argue about this, about Hilbert's Hotel. And Hilbert's Hotel has an infinite number of rooms. It's that hotel you need when you got a car full of screaming kids. It's late at night, and you're seeing all the vo all the no vacancy signs on. And then suddenly, like a vision of heaven, you see it, Hilbert's Hotel, because it has infinite number of rooms. No matter how many people are in the hotel, there's always room for an infinite number more. At least one more, you and your kids and your wife. Uh, but that hotel, that doesn't make any sense. It, that's, it, it leads to nonsensical consequences. Because even when the hotel is full, there's always room for one more. And if you were, how would, if the fire alarm went off in Hilbert's hotel, how would you ever evacuate this hotel? Uh, because when you've evacuated an infinite number of guests, there are still an infinite number who need to be evacuated. And Hilbert, who is really an amazing fellow, one of the – David Hilbert, one of the, the greatest mathematicians and logicians of the 20th, late 19th and 20th century, early 20th century, um, devised this, in, uh, this story in order to show that a real infinity is – leads to consequences that are nonsensical, and by nonsensical he meant there is absolutely no empirical real evidence that such a hotel could exist. And interestingly enough, just the latest edition of New Scientist has a whole article about why we have to abandon the concept of multiverses or at least an infinite number of them because of the problems that that causes. It's just a, one of those lucky coincidences uh, there. So that was the first argument. The second argument is also there in the, the beginning of Some Answered Questions, which is the thing the book of Abdul Baha's I concentrated on. Contingency means everything we know is contingent. In other words, it has a cause external to yourself. None of us popped into existence out of nothing. It would be nice if it did, um, sometimes at least. You know, it would be nice to find uh, a credit card that 
has a hundred thousand dollar maximum on it and it's got your name on it and it's just miraculously appeared there nothing oh, maybe it'd be a bad thing nothing brings itself into existence okay nothing can bring itself into existence um, for the simple reason that if you want to bring yourself to existence you have to exist before you exist if you want to bring yourself into existence you already have to exist this is logically impossible uh, so therefore everything we know is con contingent and this is uh, from what Abdul Baha says because a characteristic of contingent beings is dependency and dependency is an essential necessity therefore there must be an independent being whose dependence is essential first of all I just like to say about that this is another one of those passages and there are far more of them in the writings and I think a lot of Baha'is are aware of that are basically heavy-duty philosophical statements they are technical philosophical statements uh, they they really can't be understood uh, without some basic knowledge and ability and they certainly have to be understood intellectually okay so he says some th everything it has essential necessity and if everything has essential if everything is essentially contingent then there must be something that isn't contingent to bring them out into existence otherwise the universe wouldn't exist we wouldn't be here discussing this this this, this issue okay so a non-contingent independent being you know an external cause must exist to bring contingent beings into existence there is just the, the are there is just no way okay and Abdul Baha refers to this uh, in has several quotes there it is certain and indisputable that a creator of man is not like man because man is a power man a powerless creature cannot create another being we we can't I know there's a lovely there's all sorts of claims from science uh, and other people uh, or scientism I have nothing against science it's scientism you know Richard Dawkins and uh, a few few others that are the problem the scientist claims I can make life says to God I can make life too you know and God says okay let's let's do that and the, the 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 scientist reaches down and grabs a handful of dirt and God says no 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 you make your own dirt and when you see that when you think that through and I've been thinking that through about 45 years you will realize what a profound joke that is you make your own dirt it's uh, man cannot create another being okay man did not create himself we've already talked about that because you cannot create yourself and therefore the first cause is not contingent it must be unlike all contingent beings and that again proves the existence of the of the, the necessity the logical necessity of a non-contingent being and that is God whether someone is persuaded by that well again there's persuasion is a tricky thing and there's a there, there's lots lots to do um, by extension the universe is contingent everything in the universe is you know when everything in the universe is contingent which it is then and the universe is made of everything then the universe itself is contingent it requires a f creator a first mover now some people are going to say that uh, well that's a certain logical fallacy called the, log the fallacy of composition but the fallacy of composition has uh, has well known and well understood um, exceptions for example if you say that everything in your body is an atom then guess what your body is made of atoms and has whatever character existential characteristics atoms have so that's essentially what this is this is saying so the universe itself requires a creator the argument from um, 
wait a minute, no, I, I went backwards, didn't I? I want to go forwards. The third argument that Abdul Baha uses is the argument from sufficient reason or the principle of sufficient reason. Now, the it's, it is just shortened as the PSR, and it's the basis of all science. If you abandon the PSR, you have abandoned science. Um, because the principle of sufficient reason says that for everything or event, there is a reason why that thing or event happened. And it doesn't matter what culture you're in, uh, what uh, when you live in history, the PSR worked. Uh, if if you're if you're if you were living in 10,000 BC and God forbid your child drowned, you would not go be going to look to the fire for the cause of your child's death by drowning. You are trying to satisfy the principle of sufficient reason. You know water and only water explains why your child drowned. In other words, water is the only adequate explanation. Um, and for some things, you need, and for the creation of the universe, all of creation, the adequate reason must be of the right kind. In the, our example, water and have the ability to do what it does, which is to prevent breathing. And so it has, there's the ability and it's the right kind. And when it comes to the whole universe, to make a long story short, the only logically conceivable thing that has that power that is adequate is a god as philosophically uh, def uh, defined. Okay, This is because nature does not explain itself, and we'll see more of why nature does not explain itself and why, why is the writing say religion and science must work together will we'll become a little more clear later. Um, I guess later is now. Uh, all natural, purely, if you try to explain nature strictly in terms of nature, natural laws itself, you're going to get an infinite regress. And in logic and in mathematics and in science, an infinite regress is the kiss of death. It means that your logic and your reasoning have broken down. And that's how it is understood nowadays, uh, not just by philosophers, but by others as well. And the, the, the reason is simple. Uh, every natural explanation requires another natural explanation. Recall, you know, think about the book borrowing, and that goes on forever. And so at some point, we have to get to something that is not natural, is supernatural in that sense, that is, can avoid the consequence of, of requiring a cause in itself. I hope I, I, I made that clear. Um, we'll, see, we'll come to this again in, in a little bit, uh, so I'll just leave it there for now. The proof from nothingness. The proof from nothingness is implicit in the PSR and the principle of sufficient uh, uh, sufficient explanation. And Abdul Baha says, for absolute nothingness cannot find real existence. It has not the capability for existence. Okay, so nothingness is the non-existence of anything. So how existence could come from anything is it's logically impossible. Now at this point I have to rush in to say that the nothingness they're talking about in quantum theory is not an absolute nothingness. It is not related to this nothingness. It is more like a quantum potential, which is something, something very strange and has some odd characteristics. That's true, but it is not absolute nothingness. Uh, to claim that absolute nothingness can bring something into being is a logical error, and we call that it's, it's, it breaks the law of identity. Nothing 
nothingness is not something. In other words, it's trying to say that A is the same as not A, and that is logically a no-go. And that's a no-go. doesn't matter what culture you live in or what time in history you live in. You know that A is not not A. You know that having eaten lunch is not the same as not having eaten lunch. And if you, that goes on for too long, you will starve to death. But everybody knows A does not equal, is, you know, is, does not equal not A. So it's not a culturally dependent logical principle. Okay. Uh, the eternal universe argument. There's, a, there's an argument that says that no God, there is no God needed as a source or ground of being. Uh, and there's the universe has always existed. I, now, this is quite different from the Baha'i concept of the universe has always existed. Because in the Baha'i writings, God has is, and is the ground of being. That's a totally different kettle of fish, logically, than simply saying the universe has already, you know, has always existed. There's a lovely moment in, in a debate between Bertrand Russell and a Jesuit named Frederick Copleston who wrote the best history of philosophy in 18 volumes ever written. And in the end, Russell is reduced to saying, why can't you accept? It's just there. The problem with saying it's just there does a couple of things which are bad. One is it abandons the principle of sufficient reasoning, which is the basis of science and rationality. It's basically, in that sense, it's an evasion. Secondly, it violates the empirically observed contingency of all things. Okay, uh, it's again, it's 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 that simple. It's it's not empirical, which means there is no observation to support that. That's a a logical response. And secondly, it is a simple logical error because you are undermining the very principle on which science is is based. Now. Think, leave it at that. There's another argument that, uh, and I think this is very important to be aware of, is that people use when they ar argue against the existence of God, which is called the God of the gaps argument. And it simply says, oh, the only reason you stick in God because there's something, there are some things science can't explain, and you just rush in and explain them with God. You're sort of like the little Dutch boy putting his finger in the hole in the dike. Uh, well, there are some problems here. First of all, it's neither empirical nor logical. It doesn't say it, – it says nothing to disprove a properly argued God proof. In other words, it's, it's, a, it's a, an assertion, a claim, but it doesn't actually prove anything um, and is – in that sense, is an expression of faith. It doesn't bring in any uh, new information to say that the arguments for God is wrong. It's simply saying, "G. Whitakers, I hope in the future science will be able to explain this." That's not as easily that there are problems with that. And secondly, the God of the gaps leads to an infinite regress, and that's not a scientific answer. You know, as I said before, the problem is nature cannot explain itself. So if you – which is exact in, in, in its own existence, which is exactly what supernatural God hypothesis does. So the God of the gaps is a rhetorical and not a logical argument. If you try to put in a natural scientific, quote-unquote, scientific explanation where the gaps were, you'll simply end up with the same regress forever and ever and ever. And as soon as you have an infinite regress in logic and science and reasoning, it's over. You, you have made a fundamental mistake somewhere. The God of the gaps is what I call a rhetorical argument. It sounds great, but logically meaningless. Okay, Abdu'l-Baha also gives us the argument from law and form. In other words, the universe needs – has form. In some ways, we could say – we could combine this in some ways with the argument by design. But that argument is – could get pretty abstruse, although 
it's it's more powerful than people think. Uh, a man named Anthony Flew was the foremost atheist philosopher of the 20th century, and in the year 2000, he actually said, I am a believer, not in a particular religion, but I believe there is a God, and it is the argument from design that ultimately convinced me. It, it, it's, it's much more powerful than people think. But what we want to ask is not where the form and matter comes from, but where the natural rules and laws of nature come from that give order and form. And if you argue these laws came from matter, then the question becomes, how did matter get the ability to create laws and form, and what gave its, its susceptibility to be influenced by law or form or to influence other things? And so if we stay with natural expl explanations, we wind up again with an infinite regress. Okay, I've I've already I'm trying to speed up here because I want to shut this down and, uh, and you can get to some questions uh, very shortly. Uh, about the if you argue about design, the best way or discuss design is not to argue about what are the chances of all of the millions of mutations that have to go right to form the to form the beautifully functioning mouth of my dog my little whippet, um, it's to ask what is the origin of the laws of nature and what evidence do you have that na the, na material can even create these particular laws. Okay, I'm going to skip the argument. There's one other argument that, uh, our, that Abdul Baha uses. Um, and it's called the argument from degrees, and it is an argument that comes from an earlier time and uh, is hard for modern people to understand. Uh, so Abdul Baha basically says, because there is there are imperfect things, there must be something perfect. Okay. And that word perfect has certain meanings and all that that I don't think would help you to get into it, into a modern uh, exploration. So I'm going to use the concept of limitations, but it's the same argument. If something is absolutely perfect, it has no limitations. So there is a connection between the two. So all phenomenal things have limitations, and limitations have to be imposed in some way. And it's very clear that what imposes limitations must be superior to what is limited, at least superior in power. For example, if you have a sandbox and all these you know, millions of grains of sand, you impose limitations upon them by building a sand castle. But that can only be done by something that has powers and abilities that the sand castle does not, something that is... Uh, superior to them. Okay, when we apply this principle to the whole natural phenomenal universe, it is clear a supernatural entity or principle is needed which does not have any limitations. I think we're running out of time. I'm going to leave. The Baha'i writings use the ontological argument, and if you're interested, uh, please, please. Uh, Right in. I'm going. To, I'm going to finish up with two points. You will very often nowadays hear the argument that God is uh, that God has been disproven by science, and I'm going to say that's nonsense. And I'm going to say that's nonsense using the meaning of nonsense in a logical way. In other words, you you can't say this without messing yourself up logically, because a, for an object to be a true for, to be a true subject of science, it's got to be material or physical, it's got to be quantifiable or measurable, it's got to allow testable predictions, it's got to allow reproducible test results, it must be falsifiable, in other words, you must show how you can prove it wrong or what are the signs that you are wrong, it must be limited, it can't be a proof about everything. Um, 
God meets none of these criteria. God is simply not an object of scientific study in today's world. Um, anybody who claims they have made a scientific statement about God is, is it, it's self-contradictory, it's not scientific, and it's logical nonsense. I think particularly of Richard Dawkins. By the way, if anybody's interested, I have a 42-page compendium of the logical errors of Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris, and Christopher Hitchens. And I don't mean differences of opinion. I mean logical errors of the sort that my dear old logic professor, Father Dr. McKenzie, could say, I want you to read this book and I want you to identify every logic error by name. Okay? And... The same. The other thing that you will hear a lot about is Occam's razor, and I put there, and that's the theme. It's not an axe. Uh, we. It's quite correct. We do not add needless complications to th to things. The problem is we can only say something is a complication if we know everything about it. We can only say some some additional idea is needless if we already know any everything about it. But the fact is we don't know that about the universe, and so therefore to try to dismiss the God argument by saying that it's a, it, it fails Occam's razor uh, is, is a misunderstanding of Occam's razor. Okay, I think I'll finish there and try to open up some, you know, be available for a few questions. Thanks, Ian. That's, that's fantastic, and I, I'm sure people will appreciate it very much. There is a question box in the, um, the over on the right side, and yes. uh, people can type things there. Um, someone just posted a very long comment here. Let me see if I can find it here. In order to discuss application, maybe I misheard, but it sounded like you were rejecting the idea of the multiverse. While the Baha'i writings indicate the universe is infinite in space and time, that there must have always been a creation and the creator, because the creator needs a creation. If the material created by the Big Bang is not infinite, then it seems the Baha'i writings would require some kind of multiverse, and that its references to creator refer to a nature of dependency or sustenance, not a temporal relationship. That's from Brett Zamir. Okay, the answer to that is, is pretty straightforward. No, I'm not denying that, uh, that there are many worlds of God, but I don't think we can conflate the many worlds of God in the Baha'i sense with a multiverse, which is, has been uh, theorized as a mathematical necessity to make up some, to, uh, to make some sh up some shortcomings of mathematical and physical procedures. I also think people should re uh, 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 people should realize that the word infinite, and I real I'm aware of this this problem, should not necessarily be always be read as literal. There are places uh, where it should probably read as uh, philosophical or as, as uh, metaphorical. Uh, and the reason I suggest that is because if we don't, if we have a univocal meaning of that word, then we will find that there are – there are some very, very serious contradictions in the Baha'i writings, and one of my basic premises in my own explorations is that I believe there is a coherent, uh, reasonable philosophical system or systems embedded in the Baha'i writings, but they are not logically you know, bad. They are, they are not destroyed by logical self-contradictions. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, Nikki Daniels asks, um, you mentioned the 42-page document or thesis. Where can we get a copy of that? Just email me, and I will be more than happy to email it to anybody who wants it because it's a – it's a, you know, I, 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 I'm not saying this to, to put on the dog or anything, but I've mailed it out to people before, and generally the, 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 the reviews are raving. Uh, when, when, when they apply these in some of their discussions with their atheist friends. That's good. I'll, uh, I'll type up the email address and send it to people in the chat box in a minute. 
the uh, it was available uh, on the first slide. Um, someone also asks this interesting question here, um, Sandra. Um, would you place Stephen Hawking's in the same category of those who claim there is no God, scientifically speaking, uh, as I guess you know Christopher Hitchens? Um, yeah, well, Christopher Hitchens isn't a scientist. He's just a very brilliant writer and a great talker. But um, I, uh, yeah, the, I'll leave it at that. Um, Stephen Hawking's, yeah, he tries to show why there is no necessity of God. As a matter of fact, there is a Baha'i run uh, web page called Common Ground by Stephen Freiberg and, and Maya. I'm sorry, Maya, I forget your last name at the moment. Um, and I've done a review of Hawking's latest work and show logically it just doesn't hold together. It, it, it just doesn't. That's, that's all that I can say uh, uh, or, or, or want to say. It, it's it's not. It may be convincing to some, but logically, it doesn't pass muster. So I would put him in that category. Yes. Um, Robert asks, "Can you say more about the ontological proof of the existence of God in the Baha'i writings?" Oh my goodness! Uh, I'll tr I'll try to get it down to. Oh, I'm trying. Let me just try to find it here. Basically, the ontological proof tries to show that you could – it is impossible not to believe in God if you think logically. And if you think logically then, and then define God as a being – well, let me, let me give it to you in its shortest possible form. Uh, sorry, I had to collect my thoughts there because I was trying to think now what did I used to say to my students. It, it's, it's very simple. The idea of God is not nonsense because logically speaking, you can assert the scientific idea of God that we had at the beginning of this talk without falling into self-contradiction. So the, in other words, an all-powerful God is possible, logically possible. But if an all-powerful God is logically possible, he cannot be all-powerful unless he exists, and we know that and, and reality exists. And therefore, if an all-powerful logical God exists, uh, is possible, then he must exist. And that is the, the ontological proof in a nutshell. It is very controversial. It's been around for 800 years. Some very brilliant modern logicians, Kurt Gödel, the guy from the uncertainty theorists, was a total believer in it and had mathematical forms of it. Alvin Plantinga is a new logician and, sci and philosopher who has another version of it. But it says if it is possible for an all-powerful being to exist, and the answer is either yes or no, then such a being must exist logically. There is no escape from that. That's the, the quick 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 answer. I'll be I'd be more than happy if you have further questions I'd you know email me and we can get into the nitty grits. Yeah I put up your email address uh, in the chat box. I hope everyone saw that. Um, Felicity says could you go back to slides nineteen and twenty and perhaps review those a bit more. The argument from design, okay. Abdul, the Baha'i, basically the argument from Baha design says that the universe has order, it has form, it has law. And the Baha'i writings state that with those two quotes I, I have there is, you know, and, and Abdul Baha says the universe creation of God is not a fortuitous composition and arrangement. In other words, it did not happen by chance and uh, the other quotes do the same thing. This piece of bread proves that he has a maker. If you has a maker, if you look at the context, you see that it it had to be formed somehow. Okay. Uh, without design, we must still, you know, if people try to take away the idea of design, that there is a maker of the universe. 
and say that it happened without design, that still leaves the problem, and it all happened by chance. That still leaves the problem, and the problem is how did the or laws of chance and probability by which these things, these forms developed originate? Where did they originate? Where did the laws of gravity or thermodynamics, where did atoms get the attribute of being able to be influenced by them and to influence other atoms. Uh, so the denial of design simply puts you back, simply delays the inevitable conclusion that you need a designer of some kind by a couple of steps. And then people tend to overlook the fact that, well, if there were – there had to be laws of some kind for form to develop, then where did those laws come from? And if you try to stay within a natural science explanation, well, they came from other laws. And where did those laws come from? They came from still other laws. It gets a little bit like the, the old joke, you know, the world's resting on a turtle or an elephant, and the elephant is standing on the turtle. And it's turtles all the way down. It's an infinite regress of turtles. Uh, the same here. You simply have an, an infinite regress of uh, explanations of, of yeah, natural explanations. But that makes no sense. That is illogical and unscientific. So therefore, no logical explanation of natural laws is logically possible. The formation you know, of natural laws requires other natural laws and leads to an infinite regress and the you know, end of logic and science. Uh, this is what is meant by nature cannot explain itself. If you try to explain the existence of nature by strictly natural, i.e. scientific means, and by scientific I mean precisely those characteristics that I gave you that are standard, uh, that things have to be measurable and physical and so on. If you try to stay within that framework, you will always end with an infinite regress. And the fact that it's an in you end in an infinite regress shows that these attempted explanations are logically false. They are, as we say in logic, nonsense. In other words, they, they don't make any sense. Uh, nobody really knows what they mean. Okay. I've got another one here for you. Good. I've got another one for you. Uh, Ian Zarin asks, as we don't know uh, much about the worlds beyond this world and the discoveries of science, no matter how basic, can only give indications of that. There is much more out there than we know. Of course, science cannot prove the existence of God. But it can give indication of leading the way in a scientific way to find to new, find new facts about our reality and the fact that there is much more than the visible world. I think that science leading is leading to recognition of the proof that God is not necessarily a nonsensical thing. Um, yeah, it it can. It's it's just not being used that way. I I agree totally because the writings say the names of God, uh, the various names of God are in the cre you know the things that we find in the natural world around us. What has to happen? Part of the recognition that that God, uh, that a, a God is not necessarily a, a bad or a stupid concept, is the recognition that natural laws alone can cannot explain nature. We need to go, we need to transcend nature. Uh, we need, as the old medieval used to say, a supernatural maker. Um, however, there are limitations to science, and science itself may have to evolve. As long as science chooses to stick to the current paradigm, which with its six and sometimes seven characteristics, there is no way you're going to get any kind of proof of God or scientific proof of God, which is hard to imagine anyway, um, what, what that could even even look like. So, But what that points to is that science and religion need to work together. I personally have a very simple way of showing the way they work together or should, and that is to take Abdul Baha's statement, which, which is an Aristotelian statement, that there are four causes to things. There is the material cause and the, you know, the, the wood, the efficient cause, the carpenter, and I'm just repeating Abdu'l-Baha 
off the top of my head. The formal cause, which is the plan for the chair, and the final cause, which is the purpose, and would say the two give us a complete picture of reality together because science looks after the material and the efficient cause, and religion, formal cause may be a kind of a transitional thing that works to some, you know, in, in both areas, but the final cause, the ultimate purpose, is exactly is, is that which is supernatural. It's not available within the laws of nature itself. It's, it's, it transcends them. So I'm no, I'm far from trying to create a rift between science and religion. Uh, quite, quite the opposite. Uh, I'm trying to find a way how the Baha'i writings can show us how the two can fit together. And I think Abdul Baha has done that in that in, when he talks about the four causes. Uh, because causality is the basis, the concept of causality is, you know, is essential to science, but it's all essential to all understanding, and so the two can work together. They do not; they're not working at cross purposes. They don't, science only works against religion. I think when you get people like I hate to say this, but it's Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris. There are others, but those are the two most prominent ones who who simply misuse science and their data from science to to make statements that they can't back up. Okay. Here's two, here are two questions, uh, uh, Ian. Uh, Negin asks um, that uh, I've heard that some people believe that God is human-made. They think that God is a concept that humans created for themselves. How can you answer them? And I'll add also Lisa's question, because um, I thought maybe if I give you two at once, they'll be a little faster to answer. Uh, she asks a very interesting question. Is an afterlife logically possible or probable? Is this linked in any way with a logical proof of God? Well, let me ask, answer the first one, which was about uh, how do you answer people who say that God is just a human invented concept? Well, I suppose if you, if you think that logic is a human invented concept, some people would say, but of course it is. The problem with logic is at least the kind of logic the Baha'i writings use, which is classical you know, logic, which some people call Aristotelian logic, and don't let the name put you off, uh, is common sense logic. Everybody knows the law of non-contradiction. When you're crossing the street, there is either a truck coming at you or there isn't. Not both at the same time and not neither. It's that simple. Um, so when you dismiss saying it's a human invention, you, the answer is yes, but it's a human invention led to by logic, and logic is something we all apply, have always applied throughout human history, and it works. So why then, what evidence do you have that the logical necessity we can show for the existence of a supernatural being is wrong. What evidence do you have for that? What logical flaw do you have? Uh, and I think you'll find ultimately if you push people on that, the answer is they have none. They're simply trying to use sociology or anthropology, uh, the fact that there are many different concepts of God, uh, but they all have a number of things in common. This gets into something, you know, it's, it's called religious ontology, in, in which I'm writing an article. And that they all have some basic things in common. For example, precisely the supernatural element that God, gods, whatever, by whatever name, in whatever culture, all have attributes that are that. It, that are different from the other contingent things around them. That recognition of transcendence and non-contingency is, is there and it's universal. And I think that's one of the places we have to go to find real evidence for uh, the Baha'i teaching of the universal unification, you know, unity, the basic unity of all religions. So the, the the second question could you I'm sorry could you repeat that? 
All right, I've got to go find that question again. That the first, que the second question that I had to do with is, you know, is the notion of the afterlife oh, logically yeah. possible or probable, and does it link to the logical proof of God in any way? Uh, yeah, it does because it. Oh boy, because it is possible to prove to show that there is such a thing as a non-material entity. Uh, that are real, that affect everybody, and one of them is meaning. Okay, and it's, it's just, I, I'd love to explain this to her. Could I ask her to 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 to, to, to write me an email, and I'll explain it to her. <coughs> Excuse me. Sure, I'm sure Lisa's listening, so she can do oh. that. Okay, uh, meaning meaning is a non-material real thing. If somebody gives you a book in a foreign language you can't read, preferably a foreign alphabet too. No amount of physical analysis, no amount of scientific analysis obeying within the total scientific framework will tell you what that book means. Those letters are like little blips. I'm just giving you the proof for a soul which will then lead on to something that's immaterial. Those letters are like the little material blips. The material letters are like the little electrical blips in your brain, which then gives you the question, who understands these electrical blips in the brain? What is it in you that knows the difference between, honey, I love you so much, waiting upstairs, P.S., you know, um, or hate you forever, took all your money, killed your dog? Somebody understands that. But the blips on the screen don't. The computer doesn't. It takes something non a non-material reality to understand something that is non-material which is meaning and that's something I would say is the soul and that can be related to the Baha'i concept of the soul and so I would think yes I would answer affirmatively yes that there is good evidence of for or one can make a good argument based on science for the existence of a soul, a non-material entity that some people call a soul. Okay. There's a, a question here by Sava, and uh, Ramin asks a very similar question. I, I'm going to use Sava's. Uh, Sava says, you did not mention the proof of Abdul Baha that says creation is either accidental, essential, essential necessity or created by will. I think Rami mentions this is in the tablet of Pharrell. Uh, he yes, then eliminates the first two. Eliminates the first two and proves that the third option is the only option created by will. Is this proof reiterated by any other philosopher in the past? Uh, actually, it's implicit in all of the other proofs because if there is an all-powerful first mover or whatever you you know the one who brings things into existence contingent things into existence there has to be the, not a moment of time but there since it's all powerful omnipotent creation in that sense was not necessary to it there must have been there is a a will a a, a, a desire a nature to create and that is the voluntary. I know I'm not expressing that as well as I would like to, but that is the basic idea. That's why I didn't choose that, because I did not want to get uh, – it's there. I'm aware of it, of course, but I did not want to get into the whole business of explaining what the uh, – you know, the, the accidental and the necessary and the voluntary very were. But they are also proofs of God. There are still other proofs of God in, in the Baha'i writings, but these are the major ones that people will largely run into, which is why I focus, focused on them. Another one for you. Uh, we're, we're now uh, 12 minutes after the hour, so we probably need to wrap this up in another question or two. Um, Alan, Alex asks this question, Abdul Baha, when using the argument from degree, says in chapter 2 of Some Answered Questions that weakness of the creatures is proof of the power of God. Baha'u'llah says in the long obligatory prayer that God is exalted beyond attributes. Thus the power that our weakness proves is not really an attribute of God, but a limited human conception. So how is Abdul Baha's proof from degree a logical proof of God? It's a logical proof of God because it makes the existence of God a logical necessity. And since man, if for man, 
And since man is a rational being, in fact, the Baha'i writings are unique among all religions in defining the human soul as, quote, the rational soul. And Shoghi Effendi, by the way, in a real bit of an interesting phrase, talks about the rational God. Uh, then if God is a logical necessity, then that is a proof of God, unless you want to argue that, that everything else is simply, uh, that all we're doing is dreaming. And, and uh, if somebody really seriously takes that position, there, there, is, there is no argument uh, with that. If, if somebody wants to believe that this is all a dream and that everything we, we you know, this, there is no argument against solipsism. So I I don't I don't see any problem there 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 at all. After all, if there was a problem, Abdul Baha would be con contradicting himself uh, because he also says that there is a proof of God. There, right at the beginning, we started with where he says that God can be logically proven to exist. So therefore, for a reading like that, see uh, page two. The existence of the divine being has been clearly established on the base of logical proofs. Okay, so I I I base myself on that because I I think that if, in other words, the writings are saying correct reasoning can tell us true things. They may not be able to tell us everything, but they can tell us true things, and. That, that's how I would go about answering that. Again, we could get into nitty grits if somebody wants to, um, to explore that further. It's an interesting question, though. There's one more, and I think this may be our last question. Uh, Alan asks, the first step to believing in God is probably believing in spiritual reality. The holy writings make reference to the worlds of consciousness as the only fruits of the material world. Baha'u'llah says science will never understand the rational soul. A clear border between science and the spiritual realm would seem to be in the study of consciousness in particular. Scientists can observe and stimulate the brain in many ways, but cannot directly observe consciousness. Uh, for example, if they use a needle to stimulate a particular nerve cell, the subject may recall a memory, but the only way what's going on in consciousness can be known is to ask the subject or to observe the subject's behavior. Isn't the fact that consciousness can never be directly observed a proof of the existence of spiritual reality. Well, well, yes. What he's saying, what uh, what he's saying, and he's quite correct in saying that you cannot objectively observe subjective experience. Otherwise, you could develop a machine that could tell other people, give other people my experience of uh, eating good wonton soup, which I happen to like a lot. Uh, <laughs> And uh, you cannot give other people their subjective, exper uh, subjective experience. So is consciousness one of, the, one of the ways of proving God? Yes, of course, because consciousness is something that is immaterial, and that's why I brought up the idea of a meaning. A meaning is everybody says, show me something that's real, it's not material. Well, the meaning of a book or a poem or even a scientific formula. Uh, so we know these realities exist, and if I understand this this question or comment correctly, I would say that it, it's on the right track because it's, it seems to be heading toward the idea that science and religion are two wings. They don't necessarily have to agree on everything. If science, if religion had to agree, if Baha'i writings had to agree with everything, they'd be changing their their the writings weekly, because so many things change, um, even significant things change. Uh, and that is why I suggest, suggested the model of the the causality given by Abdul Baha, which is that science studies the uh, the material and the effect of causes. And the uh, you know religion and the other uh, uh, studies the formal and certainly the final causes and the formal cause would of course be related to consciousness so there's a bridge there between the two 
of them because that that's the medievals did think of the formal cause or formality as a form of consciousness and i think they were right there i want to thank you ian i'm putting on my camera as well now um and uh, i think we pretty much reached the end of this um particular um, session today. I want to thank everybody. Uh, Boyd, if you can make me the presenter again, I'll put my slide up which lists the upcoming um, uh, upcoming uh, things that are going to be, you know, the next uh, month or so. Uh, of course, good, thanks. Uh, you can see the Baha'i Faith and Philosophy, which uh, is being taught by Ian, starts on uh, the 10th of February. And if you go to our website, you can see it under Ann Perry's talk, WilmotInstitute.org there. Uh, if you go to WilmotInstitute.org, you can click through to the lists of courses, and each course is a button you can click through to find more information and also to register. In addition to Baha'i Faith and Philosophy, we also have Exploring the Hebrew Bible or Christian Old Testament that starts on the 15th. Charters of the Faith uh, covers the uh, Will and Testament of Abdu'l Baha, the Tablets of the Divine Plan, and the uh, Tablet of Carmel, Shoghi Effendi identified these three as the charters of the faith, and that course starts on the 20th. Our course on climate change begins on the 1st of March, and that is a very important uh, topic, as you know. Um, and uh, the House of Justice recently uh, replied to somebody who was complaining we were offering a course on the subject saying that this is something the high institution should do. Also on March 1st, Ann Perry will be giving our next web talk on the topic of where spirit intersects art, and you can get more information at that particular link. I don't currently have a, um, I don't actually have a link for the registration for that talk ready, because I'm not absolutely positive we're going to continue to use this system, but we probably will, and we'll get that uh, registration link out to people as soon as we're sure. Uh, she, of course, is the lead faculty member for Baha'i Faith and the Arts, which starts on the 10th of March. That's why we're doing her talk on the 1st. And there's our YouTube channel down at the very bottom. Uh, it, you can always Google it, I think, once you go to YouTube and find it there. We already have John Hatcher's talk up from last time, and we will have Ian's up within the, probably within 24 hours, maybe even by tonight. It depends on if there are any problems with the recording. Uh, that's really everything that I've got. Uh, I want to, again, thank you, Ian, so much for this really marvelous presentation. It's been uh, just fantastic to, uh, to have you on today. And um, we'll also be able to make the, uh, the, slide, the um, slides available if, if Ian wants us to do that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Please, please do. So I think you can always email uh, Ian to get them that way, but we can also put them up somewhere on our website if people want to get them that way. We have a place called Publications or Materials, and we can put them there. So I think that's it. I want to thank everybody again for their participation. We're very appreciative of you being here. Uh, we maintain an audience the whole time. It was full again, and uh, we're very grateful that for our 20th anniversary, we're able to provide this service to the Baha'i community. So until March 1st. Uh, wish everybody a good month, and we'll see many of you then. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.